And welcome everyone to a, another edition of the Wisdom Keeper podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Miles Neal. I am in New York City for a brief visit and with two new friends who are going to join me on a very special edition of today's podcast to explore the mythopoetics of the journey, uh, beginning with a very common origin. So today's podcast includes Christiana Polites, who is a scholar practitioner of Tibetan medicine and the Tibetan inner yogas. She is the director of Pure Land Farms, Soarigpa Institute, Sky Press, and Young Chigma Arts and Music, where together with Dr. Nita, she preserves and teaches the Tibetan medicine, uh, medical science, literature, self-healing methods, and creative arts. And we're also joined by Lama Justin von Boydish, uh, Boydish, excuse me, who is a scholar practitioner of Vajrayana Buddhism, a chaplain who has formerly worked with the New York City Department of Corrections, and an author of Modern Tantric Buddhism, which I had the pleasure to review, as well as numerous articles. He's the co-founder, along with Lama Rod Owens of uh, Bumsipara, virtual community and tantric practice uh, uh, online, as well as the co-director, along with Dr. Nita, uh, with, of the Yangti Yoga Retreat Center, where they lead traditional dark retreats. I've asked uh, the, uh, these wonderful practitioners to join me on a podcast, mainly because we um, both or all have experienced the joys of the pleasures and the fortune of our origin story beginning in Budgaya on the Antioch Buddhist Studies program with Director Robert Pryor. We each were there at different years, but I think we can all agree that it was a catapult or catalyst for the rest of our careers. And I'd like to make this conversation as relevant to listeners out there because I, I think we all share that the pandemic itself is a kind of portal, a door opening, a gate that has been open, thrusting us into a new paradigm, the potentially new eon between the Piscean and the Aquarian age. And I think these moments of coming into contact with the Dharma are crucial. They probably have served as a lifeboat and refuge truly remarkable teachers that all of us have spent time with. And then I think there's also in tr tremendous innovations that each of you have done. So there's something about <clears throat> really holding on to the sacred lineage, but then doing your part to move it forward. So I really want to have a very rich conversation about where we come from and where we're going. And to do that, I'm going to start with each of you. Uh, I'll start you off with a quote that we often start the podcast with, which is, in order to go forward, sometimes we have to go back. Christiana, why don't we start with you? Any thoughts, reflections on that pithy quote? I think that's very true. I tend to reminisce a lot about my past and different life experiences. And I often try to look back and think, you know, what did I learn from that situation? I have a habit of wondering, I don't think this is a very healthy habit, but of wondering, oh, what if I had done that <laughs> instead of that, you know? And I used to, when I was younger, I used to take these moments of transition and moments of choices very seriously. I thought, oh, if I make the wrong choice, you know, my whole life is going to go, you know, down the drain. And if I make the, and as I kind of, you know, got a little bit older and and look back at these moments, I don't feel as much weight into all these decisions, I feel more, oh, that was a moment and it was a path and it took me in one direction, Direction, but ultimately, you know, the path is, is a lot larger than that. And these are just, you know, drops of life experience. So I tried to, you know, have a bit of a more big picture, big picture view, but I often, you know, I often find myself reminiscing and, um, I don't have the sharpest memory, I, I have to confess. So, you know, when I reminisce, sometimes I feel I can actually feel a little bit like as I reminisce in this life, it's a little bit similar to what it might feel like to reminisce in past lives and, and other lives. You know, if I think even of, you know, that time at Antioch, I said, well, that really feels a little bit like a, you know, like a past life. And so, yeah, it's just kind of interesting to try to pick up on those moments and then, you know, see how, how that's projecting us into the future and also feel that maybe this life is not as important as we think. And those moments are not as important as we think, but try to kind of see the, you know, the bigger picture. 
Beautiful. I'm sensing, I'm sensing a nice light touch there. Uh, you've grown into a light touch. So something is working. <laughs> Justin, what about you? We have to yeah. go forward in order to go. Oh, we have to go backwards in order to go forward. Yeah. It makes me thinking of, uh, makes me think of slowing down. Um, I probably have suffered in the past, maybe not so much now, um, in feeling very, um, I don't know if ambitious is the right word, but, but forward thinking with, you know, what to do next, where to go, uh, where does this all take me, et cetera. And it's taken me a while to learn how to maybe slow down and have the kind of light touch that Christiana so nicely uh, embodies. Um, and actually slowing down and just mm -hmm. having faith and trust in the way everything unfolds. Um, and it seems a little... Um, underappreciated these days this this kind of just slowing down maybe being a little bit more passive and letting everything kind of accomplish itself um especially in these really intense times we find ourselves in um with the environmental crisis and things like this where it can feel like the world is on fire and in many ways and in many places it is and yet getting very speedy and and trying to really like directly affect change um might be short-sighted you know and so um so for me you know slowing down and just watching uh, maybe this is also part of just the aging process too um hopefully because we were all mentioning how old we're getting <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopefully gaining a little wisdom <laughs> that happens too um to just slow down and have faith and trust and uh, and let everything be whatever it will be. So both of you guys have more of a, a feminine um, lunar, let's call it a lunar energy. Um, it, may, may, it may, has it always been that way for be, each of you? Or have you, have you, have you found that <clears throat> it's contextual? Sometimes you need something a little more assertive and a little more, more uh, controlling, or have you found that un universally it's uh it's more elegant let's say or effective to 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 be more relaxed and to let things unfold maybe that's your perception <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i'm that relaxed and <laughs> yeah i mean i i i'll i'll go there like i yes um i think that's probably true um yeah, I definitely value that. I, you know, some of the like Dharma practices that I um, enjoy and have enjoyed, um, you know, my whole practice life have included Atta Yoga and Mahamudra and Yogini Tantra practices. And, you know, there's this kind of um, like the old Dakini, like sitting back and watching all of these foolish yogins, you know, get all really intense about things. Um, that sounds really nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, maybe I am an old bikini um, in a in a youngish man or an aging man's body. <laughs> I don't know. You know, one of the reasons I started the Wisdom Keeper podcast was that I I felt that we were on troubled ground during the pandemic, and that there was an opportunity. Um, there is going to be a rebuild. I think everybody senses the collapse of structure or structural organizations and thinking, a kind of breakdown. And this quote for me is really, you know, part of an effort to look back at time-tested methods or ancient wisdom who have, you know, been have undergone a kind of rigorous uh unfolding and have been tested and put to the test and and sort of built a legacy or lineage and that whether you're studying with the shamans of south america or you're engaged in some other spiritual tradition i think this time urges us to look back and when i've been you know on the journey that i've been on I've reached into mythology and into prophecy and into astrology a lot of these more archaic kinds of disciplines and they have something to bear about the time that we're living in. They have something to tell us. 
um, and also guidance about how to move through. So the quote for me, and putting it back to you now, to to you know, if if you'd like to have another crack at it, making it really personal, what is it about the Buddhist tradition that each of you come from, the teachers, the lineages that you come from, in terms of their sacred knowledge, what is it about it that has been so appealing, so personally moving, touching? Um, and and in a way, how has it helped? I'd like to sort of l- let's slowly wade through that waters. How has it helped? How has it does not necessarily helped in, in in any immediate way, but serve as a guide for you, particularly during times when it gets challenging. <clears throat> I think the human, you know, example for me has has always been something I've always, you know, even when I was a kid, I felt kind of a, a nostalgia for cultures that I that I didn't really know or have any direct contact with. But I always had this kind of feeling like there must be other <laughs> ways, you know, I grew up in New York City and, um, you know, I traveled in, in Europe. My parents are Greek, but but I always felt like there must, you know, there are some ancient culture that, you know, people, there must have been times when <laughs> people did not live like this. And I, it's something that I, you know, that I always kind of felt, but not for any particular reason or exposure. So, you know, later when I met teachers for the first time and I, and I started to see some of these living examples, you know, it, I felt very reassured that even in these times there were this these threads of continuity of something you know from some past that was actually continuing even in this kind of very strange world and environment that we live in that there's some thread of lineage that's being maintained so I you know I dabbled in a lot of different things in my life and try you know traveled in different places and met different you know traditions but I feel for me in the in the Buddhist tradition, what I really felt something that satisfied both my heart and my mind, because there were a lot of other traditions that I felt kind of satisfied my heart, but Buddhism for me really kind of linked the the conceptual mind and the sort of inner, more of an inner longing and a heart longing. It, those two pieces for me came together, especially when I encountered the Tibetan tradition for the first time, which was, you know, in Antioch. Mm. Good. We're getting to Antioch now, Justin. And then, and then I also the thing that I really loved was to see how this human expression of this, you know, from these traditions, how it really um, manifests in a lot of different forms. You know, there was not this model of this perfect, per, you know, this perfect behavior and this perfect person. That there were all kinds of, you know, different personalities and and different manifestations of different types of wisdom. And and I really, you know kind of really connected with that it made it made me feel hopeful about you know just learning to be myself you know can can i follow up Chris, christiana before buddhism what were some of these what kind of traditions did you have exposure to that you enjoyed well before buddhism i i started practicing yoga actually the you know the what put me on the path was reading Siddhartha when I was 14, that was required reading for my ninth grade world religion (laughs) class. And I thought, wow, this is, I hated school at that particular age in my life. And I hated reading and I hated summer reading. And, you know, that book, I thought, oh, that really inspired me. And then um, I started practicing yoga when I was pretty young, around 16, like just at the, in New York City, when it was just kind of starting to get cool and, you know, the hips, all the cool people were doing it. And and so I went to India. So my first contact before Buddhism was, you know, the ashrams in India and, and all the kind of bhakti tradition and the yoga tradition of India. And then since Buddhism, I would say that I have you know, I also study Chinese medicine, so I've practiced a little bit in the Taoist traditions, Chinese Taoist traditions, and then I had a bit of a foray into, you know, the plant spirit world and shamanic traditions. So I, those are the main ones that I've, you know, spent a little time in. Beautiful. Beautiful. How about you, Justin? Yeah. So um, I also grew up in, in New York, New York City. Um, my um, my father you know when I was when I was young my when my father's still an artist he was an artist and my mother at the time was um 
a weaver. And so I would go to galleries all the time and museums. And it was really through kind of the art <laughs> that I kind of connected with Madriana um, uh, first, although I was really interested in Western mystical traditions um, earlier before coming to Buddhism. And actually the summer before the, um, I was on the Antioch program, I spent three months in Scotland transcribing early English manuscripts on alchemy. And that was very rich. And, and at that time though, the thing that was a bit of an issue for me was that I, I was staying a research assistant for it and, and staying with this scholar on uh, alchemical texts um, named Adam McLean. And he was a bit of a hero of mine, but what I began to kind of recognize is that there were, really wasn't a living lineage that went back to the source. And so I kind of showed up to Bodh Gaya knowing, consciously knowing that I was looking to experience something that had a dynamic living lineage transmission because that, that was important to me. Prior to that, the year before that, I um, <laughs> went on this ambitious trip. I bought a one-way ticket to Morocco and uh, wanted to cross North Africa. Uh, and visit a family friend in in Egypt, and I was uh, at the same time very interested in um, uh, Sheikh Ibn Al Arabi, who was a significant Sufi master from southern Spain and and Morocco. And um, it was an incredible trip. It was very kind of strange and otherworldly um, in, in terms of my memories of it. It was the first time traveling internationally by myself, and all of this. Um, and when my experience, you know, connecting with, with Vajrayana Buddhism really was an experience of homecoming that I didn't really uh, expect to have the intensity that it did. Um, I ended up meeting um, during that program, um, a Sikhamese nun who became my root teacher during the independent study portion of that, that program. Um, and that changed my life forever. Um, and then when I returned, um, the previous Boko Rinpoche happened to come by the Burmese Vihar to teach one evening. And what I didn't know, couldn't know, <laughs> was that um, when I would return to India afterwards, then I would become a close student of his. Um, so it was really, um, it was really a homecoming kind of experience which was very reassuring because to some extent I always felt like I was from another planet um you know as a kid like always interested in things very very different from my immediate surroundings mm. um <clears throat> and when I got to India and especially when I began to encounter um practitioners teachers enthusiasts even um you know of the um you know Vajrayana world I felt at home um, so it was a very lovely experience. And also then, you know, now what to do, you know, kind of situation. I mean, I think we can all, we, we, it sounds like we all, and we've never had this conversation. This is why I intended to bring us together to have this conversation <laughs> because it's already shaping up that there's some commonality here. I mean, although you didn't use the word Christiana, Maybe we didn't exactly all feel that we fit in somehow. And sure. um, I mean, maybe that's not so uncommon in some way, but then it gets, if you get more granular, it's like you don't really fit in. And then all of a sudden you're grafting towards yoga or alchemical texts. I mean, these are, they're not your ordinary fare. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe. And the word homecoming too, I have, when I've been asked about my experience in Bodh Gaya the first time, I think that that is a universal sentiment. I mean, it is often, it gets a little cliche and is often used, but I mean, it's it's true. Um, maybe we can describe what the Antioch program is and then what years each of us were on and maybe start with, uh, you know, some take-homes, like was the transition, what was the transition like? And what was the biggest gem? <laughs> and then we'll, we'll see how, we'll see what happens when we go down that hole. Who wants to describe it? 
You go, La Majesta. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> sure, yeah. So, so, um, uh, yeah. So I was on this program in in 1995, and um, so the way that uh, my memory of the the program was, you know, first meeting in London and orienting to your group, and then spending a little bit of time very curious about what comes next and then landing in Delhi. Um, and this was, you know, the beautiful thing I think about this time was just how different India was even in the mid nineties than it is now. Um, and um, I actually, uh, Christian Wedemeyer, Dr. Christian Wedemeyer teaches at University of Chicago was, was uh, the philosophy professor um, that year. Uh, and I was really excited about meeting him, so meeting him. And then we ended up going from Delhi to Bodh Gaya, which really was a dusty little town, right? Like, you know, for for the site of the Buddha's enlightenment, probably, you know, the one of the most important sites in the Buddhist world, which is a major world religion, was a very kind of small, intimate town with a thriving community, rich community. Um and you know the program was rooted in the Burmese Vihar, which um, kind of had um, a very kind of funky feeling. And this is, it was also, you know, um, I think at the time, right, there were um, people from, you know, then Burma, now Myanmar, Myanmar weren't allowed to come to uh, to India on pilgrimage, right? So it was a, also a very interesting place for a lot of backpackers long time dharma bums would stay um and the program itself focused on the three the three yanas right starting with the theravadan tradition and the you know zen tradition usually as a as a mahayana um tradition and then vajrayana um but yeah I mean, well, what an amazing i mean this also is very otherworldly or or like Christiana mentioned I mean it, it feels like another lifetime ago in a really good way you know this kind of like and I want to also be careful about you know overly romanticizing it because it was it was mysterious and it was intense and it was pre-cell phone pre-email <laughs> up to like send faxes <laughs> as a means of communication um but so rich i mean just especially for like you know somebody who grew up in manhattan <laughs> it's just like you know very very different but at the same time i remember um you know when we were flying to delhi from london my my trip to morocco had been great and very challenging because i was at that time um i guess like 19 by myself traveling to north africa and so I assumed India would be harder. And there was something about landing and smelling the air that just felt familiar. Mm -hmm. And so this has been the thing. It's like um, as radically different as it was, there's also always something that just felt like in my heart um, familiar, even in the difference or familiar, even in the uncertainty or familiar in um the newness of of you know uh showing up to a new culture in a respectful way you know or at least an attempt to be respectful um i mean a real immersion is is how i would describe it you know i'm getting goosebumps <laughs> jump in christian don't be shy yeah, so I was there in 1999, four years later. Um, it was my, I think, third trip to India, but my first time in, in Buddhist India. And I was a student at that time at um, Harvard University, and I was studying religions. And But of course, it was very, you know, it was very different. And I remember I actually had to really... Um, you know, sort of fight to convince them to let me to go and actually to give me credit for the coursework that I was going to do there. But in the end, you know, they agreed. And um, 
Very similar to, you know, to what Lama Justin is saying, that feeling of, and, and Miles, you were talking about transitions. I always, the one thing that I always remember about India, at least in those, now it's been so many years that I haven't been back, but in when I was in my 20s, I went, you know, quite regularly. And there's always that feeling how arriving there was so natural and how coming back was just always so strange. You know, it was such a very strange experience, whether you go there for, you know, three months or one month or two weeks, you know, that coming back was always a very unusual <laughs> experience. Um, but the program was was very profound for me. I had not a lot of practice in meditation at the time. I was, you know, I was, I had some exposure, but in, in or not in Buddhist meditation, I should say, other than, you know, sitting at the local Zen center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um I loved it. I, I, yeah, I felt really at home. Um, I definitely, I loved being able to experience the different types of Buddhism and the different types of teachers. And that was definitely where I felt, oh, you know, Vajrayana, this is definitely, <laughs> this is the one for me, <laughs> you know, it was very clear that this was, this was the one for me, <laughs> you know, um, although I, you know, I benefited from, of course, all the teachings and all the teachers there. I really, appreciated the the diversity of the experience but for me the you know the homecoming was meeting for the first time the vajrayana buddhist teachings and just thinking why did nobody tell me this before you know <laughs> why <laughs> why don't we talk about this stuff why you know like it just seems so natural for them you arrive in this environment and they're all just talking about this stuff all the time and it's completely normal and i thought how come like we don't talk about this at school or at home, like everything, just death and permanent suffering, you know, like, tell me more. And and for me, it, that really was the, to give more purpose to the, to the practice. I was never very good. Um, I'm still not a good sitter. You know, I find it very hard to sit still. That's why I kind of laughed when you said I'm very relaxed. I'm actually very extremely <laughs> active and restless but um you know i think when i met the vajrayana and they, they started there was a lot of for me explanation of why why you should do this not just how you should do it but why you should do it because i was never that interested in just the technique of meditation and the you know the different types of techniques they teach you in, in different traditions i always said okay yeah but why <laughs> so you know when i finally met those vajrayana teachings i felt like i was given a whole worldview and it put a lot more you know purpose to the to the practice so it was it was a really um beautiful experience and yeah i feel really really fortunate to have been there and i feel just recently this year um during the pandemic, actually, I got reconnected with my group. I'd lost touch with everybody. And then there was an email that went out just kind of trying to reconnect in an effort to to have a reunion, which which actually we're going to do at Pureland Farms next year. But I loved hearing everybody's updates because it was just incredible to see what everybody's doing now. Like they were it, it. I really had the feeling like this program just put so many people really on the path and that they stayed on and they're just doing very meaningful things with their lives. So it was really, really beautiful just to hear little snippets of different people's stories. I mean, that is exactly what happened to all three of us. I mean, it must've been on Instagram where I don't know how I caught word that both of you were there, but it happened and it was during the pandemic. And I was like, we should all get together and talk about it because it was so significant. And, you know, as we talking about it is it's not, you guys are both very eloquent people, but it's not quite as easy as it 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 feels in your heart to express. Like, why was it so significant? I mean, you use words like immersion. I mean, just for people that don't know the Antioch program, we're talking about a college semester abroad program that brought together students could apply from all over the United States at different schools. And the Burmese Vihar that uh, Justin is referring to is a is a temple complex that houses um, uh, pilgrims and very rustic. I mean, very rustic. So you're talking about a group of 30 kids. I mean, we were 19 or 20. <laughs> we show up in India in the 90s. And Justin, that's so true. I mean, like no internet, no phones, no <laughs> cell phones, no, like we, we, we took the long train from Delhi, man, that, when that when they say you know they when they say 16 hours they mean 26 hours you know 
and and you show up and it's bare bones and you're you're eager and within i don't know within days a bunch of us have heads shaven and we're not we're not just getting lectured on the tradition then there's early morning meditation i believe that was at five o'clock in the morning and and then guess where you are i mean the visual cue of leaving the vihar down a dusty road not even paved that leads to the Mahabodhi temple, which is the mandala of enlightenment, this Vajra son of the diamond throne where the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree is there. But on the way are representative temples from all Buddhist traditions. So on one side of the street could be a Japanese temple and then the other side would be a Thai temple in its own classic architecture. So it is truly, Bodh Gaya is truly a remarkable place. And for a student who had like interest in Buddhism to be able to see, smell, taste, touch, practice in all those traditions in one place. And, and then the prominence or the poignancy of that place, the vibration of that place. I mean, I'm just trying to give a taste for like the context is really remarkable young people. And I think all of us have this kind of background story. It's like, how do you, end up there like for me i was at wheaton college i didn't fit in i was a misfit i found a pamphlet at that time there was no internet so it was a it was a paper pamphlet in the basement stacks of the religion department saying antioch buddhist studies abroad with like 1979 photographs in it of like <laughs> and i was like meditation at five in india yeah <laughs> <laughs> want to do that and then i, I have i remember getting the, out the family atlas because there was no gps no google no nothing and telling my trying to explain to my parents where where i wanted to go and we couldn't find that we couldn't find but gaia on the map we couldn't find the words but Gaia. we could find gaia but we couldn't find but gaia and like the symbolism of trying to convince my parents that this is where I want to go, where it was like stepping into such an unknown. It was like, you couldn't find it even. You didn't know what it was. It was like leaving. It might as well have been leaving the planet. I think we did. I mean, for a semester. And back then, didn't time feel like forever? I mean, parts of that trip were like so special, but then sometimes it was excruciatingly painful, either physically or getting sick or like dealing with this or dealing with that. But then mentally, too, I'm sure all of you have stories of hitting an edge of, you know, maybe having a psychic moment where you're not quite sure if you can do it. And then and then you just get picked up by another wave. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think, Christiana, when you're saying something happened in the pandemic where people are trying to get together and almost revive something is exactly what I meant by the quote when we started. It's like, what What did we need? What were we looking for in the pandemic? We, we went back. We're trying to like reclaim something that brought us together and gave us inspiration and motivated us and oiled the wheels and sent us onto a catapult. And when I'm listening to you guys, it's inspiring. It picks me up. It, it reminds me of something that's really, really important, and especially when you're in a haze or a daze or down on energy. It's like, yeah, Justin, like, I mean, here's a here. Okay. So, you know, we're following the classic hero myth. We all had our departure story, but then there's the initiation. So like Christiana's saying about Vajrayana clear and center smack in the mouth, like that's your tradition. That's your lineage. Justin, you're talking about meeting, was it Bokar Rinpoche? Yeah, Bokar Rinpoche. And then my root teacher, um, an Ani who became my root teacher during that trip in, in Sikkim. Well, let's let's get into a little juice of that. Go ahead. Yeah. Your, your your first encounters with the teacher. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I knew actually before. So I went to Antioch College, and I I actually picked the school because I knew about this program. I was really um, <laughs> I was ready to get out of here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and when um, I also knew I wanted to go to Sikkim, um, you know, for this independent uh, research period, and. I um, developed a really beautiful friendship with um, another participant on the program, Eric, my friend Eric, who um, also wanted to go to see Kim. And he wanted to go uh, partially to meet the mother of a friend of his who he was going to college with. And so 
we decided to go together and um I think we were we were pretty um <laughs> pretty stupid. We took a bus from Gaia to Darjeeling, which took like 36 hours. Um was painful. <laughs> it was very, very painful and really kind of you know pushed us to the limit of everything. <laughs> and then we got got to Darjeeling. Darjeeling was amazing, and then from there to to Gangtok and uh knocked on this Ani's door, who happened to be the mother of a of a um, somebody he was studying with, a friend of his. And we, it was like opening the door to family. I mean, you know, Ani Zangmo um, basically just invited us in, sat us down and started teaching Dharma. And we didn't even have a place to stay. You know, we just went there straight from, from a Jeep stand. Um, uh, and she's like, oh, well, you need to stay with me. She had a two-room house. So there's one room, a bathroom, and another in her shrine room. And she's like, you can sleep in my shrine room. And so we spent um, three weeks there with her. Um, and in the morning, she would, you know, we would wake up. We would meditate together on this. Um, she had this rooftop that overlooked the valley. And Room Tech Monastery was, was across the way. Um, she taught Dharma all day. <laughs> We would cook with her, you know, and prep the food with her and, and cook with her and uh, cook breakfasts and um, teach. She would teach into the into the night and she was a little bit of a rebel. She she drank chang, so we she would serve us chang while she taught at night. Um, and it what ended up happening at one point, um, actually, this is also very quite strange. Um, one of my present teachers, Gelsip Rinpoche, who was one of the heart sons of the 16th Karmapa, was staying at Rumtek Monastery. And she, Ani Zangwa was like, okay, um, I called ahead to Rumtek and I asked Gelsip Rinpoche to give uh, you both a Milarepa Guru Yoga empowerment. Um, and so go and, you know, see if that karma manifests. And so we went and unfortunately that wasn't able to happen. Uh, and we decided, well, let's go back to her and and ask her for the empowerment. Um, Very wise. And, <laughs> well, no, and then she gave it to us, and so she was totally, you know, we and we told her we were like, you know, we, you know, want you to be our teacher. And I don't know of many nuns who you know offer empowerments and all of this. So even even to this day. Um, she gave that and Chinrezi and taught Mahamudra and tra taught Treksha and introduced um, <laughs> uh, Flight of the Garuda to us. I, I mean, it was like a big download. Um, very, 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 very um, huge amount of Dharma in a very short period of time. Um, and I, it, it literally changed the course of my life. Like I, I ended up... Um, uh yeah it was it I, I i don't even have words <laughs> for this um you know it was it was like meeting meeting a spiritual mother and um and just her she she had this a, a masters in english literature so she was she's so beautiful the way she would talk and write and translate texts actually much like dr nita like just kind of word by word line by line just sit and translate right in front of us and as a way of kind of really um not only distilling the meaning but also kind of you know showing how important it is to be able to 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 interact with with text and with meaning and you know have a real personal uh relationship to uh to whether it be sadhana or meditation or or anything like this um and you know, it wasn't always pleasant because like a good teacher, she would poke and prod and needle and make me cry, <laughs> all sorts of things. Um, but one of the most amazing things she did was uh, there's a there's a, a beautiful charnel ground kind of on the, the up the hill from her place. Um, I think it's like the northern part of town. And she had heard that there was going to be a cremation. And she's like, you know, you two should go. And um, it's the first time watching, you know, a, a body burn like that and um and it was just so mesmerizing mm -hmm. and powerful um and just you know i guess this is what i meant before like there was there were all of these seeds that were being planted at that time that i didn't understand 
until later, for example, then later becoming a chaplain, working in hospice, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working on um, on Hart Island, the city's potter's field, where there's just things I, you know, of course this all connects back to her, but I couldn't, mm -hmm. see, you know, how could, you can't see these things, you know, all the time while they're happening. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it it, it was it was an ordinary, but on, on the other side, it was it was like it was mythic, right? It was this this kind of you know entry into um into kind of a mythic realm. Um yeah, and I mean I still to this day she ended up dying in um uh, nineteen ninety-seven. So after after um I graduated from college. I went back for a year, um, and uh, she died during that trip. But uh, I mean, I have not thought, I have not stopped thinking about her since. And um, and she introduced me to you know a lot of my future teachers. Um, but I, you know, I mean, this is where like you know we ask, how did this happen why did this come to be and i mean this is karma right and yeah. this is what karma essentially is um and it's interesting right with the three of us that um and and i'm sure many other people who are on the program but that this is very unusual karma we could say where these you know mostly white you know american college kids end up going to india right but there's so many who don't so many who never have that opportunity, so many who never put that together. And and for many people who have had that experience, um, there's, you know, this, this ripening of karma that I think, you know, when you're a college kid, it's hard to understand. Oh, wow. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more in the, that use word, usage word of the, I mean, that's very explanatory, the piercing of the mythic dimension that, and and I mean, karma using karma to explain how we got there. I mean, I'm sure we feel now that it must be that we've had a past life connection with Bud Gaia and these teachers that explains how so early you would even be attracted to a pamphlet or an Antioch Buddhist studies to begin with to get you there at 19 defies any other explanation. Uh, but there's something that's just so beautiful in these stories. Um, that that heartfelt invitation into someone's home where they just give you everything. And not just the mundane a place to stay and cook for you, but so quickly taking responsibility for your soul reminds me of what Christiana was saying when she said, you know, why don't people in our, why didn't people in our culture help us with these things? Why, why, you know, I mean, I'm talking about something like the invitation to go and see the ritual pyre or the cremation. It's like out of sight, out of mind in our culture. And yet within days of meeting this person who is an archetype of a saint that takes care of your soul. She sees the full transmission and the trajectory of your soul's continuity. She says, this is going to be important. You know, go and have a Milarepa initiation even though you don't know what the hell that means. <laughs> <laughs> go and go and go and sit in the eternal ground, even though you have no idea what that means. And we're starting, my, my hope is already coming into play because now we know, you know, it was oiling the rails for you to become a chaplain and dealing with those realms. Like the foresight and the vision of these people and their absolute lack of hesitation to invest constitute this kind of incredible energy that I think then travels with you lifelong and actually between lives. Christiana, do you have any reflections on Justin's experience? Did it joggle any memories for you or any images come up for you? It did. I mean, that's it's really so beautiful to hear that. You're very fortunate. Um, it's But it's funny, the memory that it juggled for me is something that I haven't thought about for a really long time, and it's not even in the realm of Dharma. But when I was in Antioch, actually, I 
decided that I wanted to learn how to play tablas. Um, Thanks. Did we lose her, Justin? Are you with me? I am, yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, we got you. Okay, so so every night I would tablas, go to you study. caught our attention with tablas. <laughs> every night I would go to study with this uh, tablet teacher who I somehow found. He lived, uh, you know, down the road from the Burmese Vihar, and he lived in this little room with his wife, and they they owned a little, you know, cigarette shop in one of those little shops in front. And I just had this, yeah, that feeling of also going into somebody's home, which was. You know, they were in really like, a, it was they were extreme poverty and extremely small, but every night, you know, welcoming me into their home and taking the time and instructing me and teaching me and offering me food and offering something and that feeling of, yeah, that that was a, actually one of my, I forgot about him. I, I didn't think about him for a long time, but now when I think, oh, one of my teachers from that program was not, was not a Buddhist teacher, but he was my, <laughs> you know, my tablet teacher. And it was a very, very unusual and unique experience for me at that time in my life. Yeah, it, it joggles one of my memories. Same same thing, not a not a Dharma teacher. I think one of the one of the guys that worked in the restaurants across the street. Did you guys the the, the, the poly poly or <laughs> poly poly, yeah. Poly poly. <laughs> he took me to his house once. I think his name was Shiva. Shiva Shiva Nanda, Nanda. yeah. Yeah. You remember Shivananda? I was there one year after you, Justin, 96. Okay. Yeah. Shivananda, she took me to his house and it was all brick. I mean, not even mud on top of brick, no plaster, just brick. And uh, I mean, it was, there was no furniture. He had a couple of kids. His wife was in there. They sat me down on the dirt floor and said would you like to eat with us and they had whatever they had i think it was pumpkin curry and i'll never forget you know he would go out and he would work for his family and he whatever he had collected he would buy brick by brick to make an extension of his house for his son and literally it was like if he could get a brick on up there that was a job well done, you know, and he, and he took me up to the extension above it. And, you know, there was a, a small wall, wall forming. Um, first, the generosity of spirit of someone who has so little, I think really was another Dharma teaching, but not from a Lama on a high throne. It just, India does this to you. You know, those that have so little and yet have the, greatest generosity of spirit is just it it strikes you and it never leaves you you know it never leaves you um but then i mean just also i, I don't want to over idealize it i i hear heed your caution about that justin but there was something also about the joy there was a lot of joy in his eyes there was a lot of joy i mean i'm sure it was hard too i'm not trying to deny it or silver line it but honestly just he had a lot of faith, I think. He had a lot of faith, like he was doing what he could do and he was building what he could build and he loved his boys or his family and his kids and he was happy to give what he had and he was also happy to just try to build what he could for his family and there was there was real joy and I think it may make, may make such an impression for me because, I mean, I grew up pretty, really privileged. I mean, I had a lot of options. My family had good jobs and but there wasn't that kind of joy. And I think that made a huge impression on me. Like, what's what's that about? What's that about? Um, yeah. So any other stories, any sig other significant stories? I mean, for me, I didn't I didn't take to Vajrayana right away. Was it Chokinima for both of you? Mm -hmm. Must have been right. It was Chokinima Chokinima that year? was it was his obstacle year, the year that I was oh. there. So he was not there. Um, but I went to Nepal and I, I met him there during the independent research studies program. Let's see. 
I did um, Godwin Samaratne teach for you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's who I connected most with for oh, my, my so time kind. there. He was just so lovely. I mean, I don't know. I had a lot of depression when I grew up as a kid. And Godwin invited me into his room after class or meditation or whatever. Again, these are invitation stories. It's just like your story, Justin. It's like, he said, um, come to my room. There's an extra bed in there. He didn't give me a lecture. He said, just sleep on your side in the way the Buddha's final pose is laying down on the side pose. And just his energy was so chill and so lovely and so accepting. And he said, in the morning, whether you sleep or not, let's get up together, meditate at the tree. And I remember getting up, we got up before sunrise. I did actually sleep well that night. We walked, Godwin and I walked hand in hand in the night down the dusty road from the Burmese Vihar to the mandala. And at that time, there was no barricade around the tree. We were able to sit directly under the tree. And I remember clearly the sun rose, there were birds, there was mantras. He and I didn't share any words. But I remember how much love their tenderness he was so tender and i think it just like for a kid that had a lot of trauma that tenderness without words or instruction or narrative or framing or chat chit chat you can't it really got into my heart he really got into my heart and i really took to him and then when the when the when the when the gathering of the of the Vajrayana crowd and Chokinima arrived with his entourage. Like I was like, I can't deal with, this. I can't deal with all the bells and whistles of Vajrayana. My Vajrayana story didn't start until years later. I actually, after the program, I went back to Sri Lanka to find Godwin and studied with Godwin for a little while because I just mm. needed some of that very simple, very direct love. Just, I think his kindness teaching and, Awareness and kindness, it was really unadorned, uncomplicated, very embodied. So I guess I'm I'm guess I'm I'm saying that they're they got into our heart. I mean, this Ani story that you're teaching feels very heart-centered to me. Just she just she just found her way in. Yeah, you know what's what's um I have a funny um story about not funny, but meaningful story about Shivananda. That I was in Bodh Gaya in 97 when Anizamo died. And again, because this was like pre-internet days, somehow her family, she was up in Sikkim when she died. Um, her family had to call my family in New York, who then had to fax, send a fax to the Sweetie and Beauty shop, <laughs> you know, opposite the stupa, uh, you know, the, the, the Mahabodhi temple. And when I found out that she died, I mean, I, I, you know, everybody knew that she was quite ill. Um, I was completely, I was just, I could, you know, I didn't know what to do. I was, I was so distraught. And I remember being outside um, with one of the young men, Jimmy, who worked at the stupa, who's kind of uh, from Assam. He's such a sweet person, and I was crying and telling him what happened. And then Shivananda came up to me, and he was like, "What's well, you know what what happened?" And I told him, and he said, "Oh, well, you come with me." And we walked a little bit towards Gaya. There was a small Ganesh Mandir that he was he he played uh, drums at, and it was it was nighttime, and he said, "You know, you." He handed me a drum. I've never drummed anything in my life at at that point, and then they still have it since. And he was like, just play. And like I was sobbing and he's and he was just playing his drums and singing. And there was this, you know, Baba, this this, you know, sadhu whose uh, temple was. And we went all night. And it was like it was the kindest thing that anyone could do. And it was helpful for me too that it wasn't Buddhist <laughs> because I was already in my like, you know, um, I needed some other way of processing this, you know. And so to sit in a half-built 
<laughs> Ganesh, you know, Mandir, you know, with this this Baba singing songs and then Shivananda singing songs and you know all the instruments um, all sitting around a fire. It felt it felt timeless um, and really like the the best way to honor her too was just to to sing and cry and make music and be with friends and um and again you know just speaking to shivananda's generosity um you know living in new york city what people are going to say you know they might see somebody crying and say oh you come with me and um, i will take care of you for the whole Mm -hmm. night you know make sure that you're okay I had a similar experience with t- to you, Miles, as with Godwin also. I, d- I don't remember the particular content of my whatever internal struggle I was going on at the moment, but I remember going to him and telling him that I'm very sorry, but I, I was not going to attend the, you know, those that extra retreat, the, which was optional. And I said, I'm just, I'm really just not up for it. You know, I can't, I don't want to sit this weekend. And I, I, you know, I just remember him looking at me and just saying something along the lines of like, you know, just come. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and you know, you don't even need to meditate, just, you know, just come. And it was like, he said probably 10, five or 10 words to me. And I, and everything in my mind, I just felt like just completely washed. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Of course, you know, of course I'll come. And it was like, you know, all week I had been sort of processing why I didn't want to go and all this blah, 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 internal dialogue about the whole thing. And and it was just like this soothing kindness and heart. And I, it just completely set me straight in like an instant. <laughs> Why don't we jump forward a little from from from? And I just I want to just add one very yeah obvious comment. But you both mentioned the you know the lack of cell phones in India, and I, I think about this so much lately. And I try to I ask myself if it's even possible for us to have these kind of experiences like we used to have that with just because of this simple reality of this world that we live in of being so connected and i it's something i really you know struggle with i love that we're here and we're talking on the zoom and i you know i love all the connectedness that it that it creates but i really really miss those days where we actually easily had the capacity to just go somewhere and really like fully be in that situation without the just the constant contact and communication and connection it's something that i i'm i personally am finding i'm not actually able to recreate that experience for myself i just can't do it like my life has gone in such a direction and with this kind of reality that it's very hard for me to even remember what it was like it's and it's really nice to talk about it and to remember what what it was like to have that experience I think it brings brings up a broader question. I think, and I hear, I see Justin shaking his head. I'm sure he's got mm-hmm. comments about this. I mean, I also think the access to the llamas has shifted too. The that sort of unadulterated. I mean, when we talk, when you talk about Thurman or Ian Baker, you know, Glenn Mullen, when when they had, you know, first of all, it was hard to get there. And there was something about having to earn it or work for it and and then when you're there like there isn't that much distraction and there isn't a big regalia it's really get there was a level of intimacy that i think gets challenged now i think you bring up a really interesting point and i i want to ask justin because i think he's got some comment about it how have you dealt with this conundrum goes in the dark that's probably the only <laughs> that's, <true. laughs> that's the yes. best solution i just thought Thank that's probably the, well. the only way to go in the dark but yeah that is actually um it's a different kind of connected <laughs> um yeah i mean you know it's like i i was very close with the previous boker and pajay um and he he was the heart son of previous color and pajay and not as popular, so to speak, you know, 
with in terms of an entourage. Um, I I used to be able to see him really whenever I wanted, like, and, you know, it was always some kind of burning question that <laughs> get into his presence. And then, you know, of course it would all dissolve. Um, but now, you know, since he passed with his, his, his young C, uh, his reincarnation, yeah, everything is tighter, right? Like the LeBrons are, are, um, yeah, every uh, communication is harder and, um, all of this, um it's fascinating i mean i i i've seen this also just in the monasteries um you know increasing numbers of monks even have their own cars right so they have like uh, you know i was i was in sikkim um this past summer and i had tried to get up there actually right before covid i was in i was in uh india in um uh march of 2020 and like got out just in time, but I tried to get up to Sikkim, but they closed the closed the border to Sikkim. Um, you know, they're a little conservative, which was good. Um, I couldn't make it up then, so when I went back, there was a parking lot now <laughs> in this monastery, Gelt's Room Jay's monastery, which there had never been before. Um, and so now, you know, senior lamas have cars, they have cell phones, they have all this stuff, and all of the busyness. You know, many of them have TVs in their in their rooms and. Um, yeah, I think for them, some of them have, you know, quote unquote, earned it in the sense that they've worked hard in the monasteries and all this, but, but getting away, you know, I, I like to get away to a Spartan room with nothing, maybe even no power. And then, you know, um, I deal with however it is I'm going to com communicate with my family while I'm there, uh, and then have that, that experience of being completely unplugged, um, and I, I do, you know, wonder and, you know, maybe even sometimes worry about, yeah, the time that we were there, um, you know, the, these, these formative times is, is not replicable short of, uh, some kind of major <laughs> catastrophe with <laughs> like, you know, the satellite system or something like this. Um, and I think this is, this is a little scary because I think there is something about unplugging and being in uh a much more imaginal world like a visionary world that has always been an important part of Adriana practice to some extent um and the speeding you know this kind of speedy frenetic nature of our of our connectivity I don't think helps um and it 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 begs the question. I mean, I've I've actually had this conversation with people recently about, you know, is even awakening possible at the same? Like I, I you know, obviously, I deeply believe that we all have, you know, our Buddha nature, Sujata Garva, you know, inherently means that awakening is possible, uh, and and even within this lifetime. Uh, however, when we begin to look at these kind of contributing factors to how difficult it can be by by having everything you want all the time um by not having by you know having constant distraction available to you all the time you know carrying these these little computers in our pockets and um and even you know anxiety and depression levels from constantly knowing what's going on in the world as opposed to, you know, these long periods of time, you know, like when we were in Bodh Gaya, you'd have to sit and read a newspaper, an Indian newspaper to read the international news <laughs> of which, you know, maybe there was just one page. Um, so I, I do worry sometimes that we're losing, potentially losing um, touch with an interior world that exists as a result of all this. However, like Christiana points out, there's always dark retreat, <laughs> which will insert you, you know, actually, and probably I, you know, I've, I've not done much, you know, plant medicine, but from experiences that people have shared, I think there is a, a very kind of similar kind of dark retreat feels very shamanistic in, in, in a particular way. And it, it entering us into this non-materialist, world which i think is really the home it is our home i think as humans like we're not i think we've kind of placed ourselves in odd territory by being so uh materialist and even scientific um 
so it's 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 you know interesting to wonder about you know where where all this will go i mean i i want to suspend for a second the dark retreat because it represents Ooh. something very contemporary and i want to just ask each of you to paint a little a little picture of post antioch life that sort of how it impacted your trajectory as a human being maybe professionally too and where it took you and then we'll get we'll get up to the we we're going to try to just have a snapshot that'll get us to more contemporary time but i think we we had a little bit of the taste of the before and then the during so let's just do a little bit of the after i mean again i i find that you guys are both so accomplished and so steeped in the tradition and yet making these innovations so i want to i want to know exactly how maybe antioch contributed to that i'd say for me it it taught me that or one thing that i think happened there was i realized that I, i'm really not a scholar you know before i went there i had a little bit the idea that i kind of wanted to be a scholar you know, maybe I'd go get my PhD and, you know, and that program kind of really <laughs> took that out of me. And I'm happy it did because I, as I'm older, I realize I'm, I'm really not a scholar. And that was definitely just, you know, an illusion that I was <laughs> interested in pursuing, you know, it, in my, before I went there. So it definitely, I realized that you can have a a deep education that's not necessarily an academic education. So I got much more interested in, you know, in, in learning in different ways. Um, I think if I hadn't gone there, I might have, yeah, I might have gone for a PhD and taken that academic route. And I don't think that really suits me that well. I don't think I would have been, <laughs> I would have really thrived in that environment. So that that was definitely one thing. Um Definitely wandered for a while, you know, <laughs> in the 20s, not quite sure what my path was. And, you know, I did a lot of searching and trying and doing different things. And I lived in different places. Um, I think everything, there were little seeds of things. I, for me, meeting Dr. Nita was the, was the moment, but that was much later. But that was definitely the moment where he was like, okay, <laughs> here. I have a project, <laughs> do something <laughs> useful. You know, he gave me, well, prior to actually prior to meeting him, I had decided to study Chinese medicine and go to acupuncture school because I was beginning to feel like, you know, what's the closest thing to Dharma practice and action. I, I, I didn't actually didn't even know that Tibetan medicine existed at the time. So, but there was, a period where I started thinking, okay, what's the, you know, what's the closest thing you can do to put something into, you know, more practice. Uh, I think like being a chaplain, I, I is, is a wonderful expression of Dharma practice. But for me, I decided to study natural medicine and I went to acupuncture school. Um, but then, and that's when I met Dr. Nita and Dr. Nita is just very skillful at, um, giving people direction in their lives, giving lost people <laughs> direction in their lives. Here, have a project. Oh, have two. Here, have another one. You know? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so that was, I'd say that was <laughs> a, a very concrete moment for me of, you know, finding my more professional path. But, I, you know, Antioch definitely projected me in that direction. So you, I mean, Dr. Nita is your your heart teacher, but he's also your collaborator, and you, you know, he it's his vision that you fulfill. I mean, you you find a way to found these institutes. Tell us a little bit about it, what it was like for you. Well, it started very simply. You know, I was in acupuncture school, and I met Dr. Nita. There was a kid in my class. Again, this is something karmic because this this guy who was in my class was like a visiting student. He was there for a very very short time, and he said something like, "Oh, you're somehow." He knew I was interested in Tibetan Buddhism, and he said, "Oh, there's a Tibetan doctor in town. You know, maybe you're interested." 
and there was a like a weekend workshop in mantra healing so i went with him to this workshop and it's funny because that guy then really just did not like the workshop did not connect at all and then he left the school so I, you know it was like this very you know curious moment and and i had the opposite experience where i was in, it was a very low key situation there were about 12 people in a in a room dr nita was presented himself in a you know as a tibetan doctor there was no talk of dharma or yutoknyintik or or anything that i later understood you know him to be a lineage holder but i had this kind of yeah, it was just a feeling of meeting a teacher, but I, I didn't know in what capacity. I just had a feeling like this is somebody that I'm going to know in this life that I, you know, he's he's a teacher. But I, I didn't know what kind of teacher because I didn't even know that he was, you know, that the kind of teacher that he is. But I, you know, I was curious. And then I went to a few more workshops and um, at one point there was a conference he said oh, you should come to this Sorigpa conference and I went to the conference and somebody that he works with said you know I'm, I want to um, we have this book and we'd like to publish it and I said like I just volunteered to publish this book I have no experience in the publishing industry I don't know how to publish or print a, I have like I don't know anything about <laughs> publishing but I just had this feeling like you know I would like to really help them to publish this book. And of course they could have published this book without me. They really didn't need me to <laughs> publish this book. They could have done it themselves or somebody else could have helped them. And but and Dr. Nita said, great, you know, please publish the book. And um, and then that book got a little bit delayed, but the first book that we did publish was Mirror of Light, <laughs> which Lama Justin is teaching from. So it started like that, you know, this little publishing house. And then, oh, well, you're in Portland. Maybe you could organize a few classes. Or, you know, you really should have a website because people don't know about Tibetan medicine. So I'm like, I don't know anything about Tibetan medicine <laughs> either. But, you know, well, but, you know, just write something. Just put something on the web. And, and it was like all like very small things that somehow just completely... <laughs> snowball effect into many many things but it happened very you know organically and and spontaneously and then later I looked back I thought maybe he does that with everybody maybe he just says like hey maybe you like to do that maybe and and you know he just sort of and some people do it and some and I was like sure sure yes Wes I'll do it I'll do it and it it really um at that particular moment in my life like it just really the the not having somebody just give me things to do was extra, extremely useful. <laughs> it sounds, you know, it sounds something simple, but it was just incredibly useful. Like it just eliminated all indecision from, from my life. I tend to be a little indecisive and <laughs> spend a lot of time contemplating things and making decisions. And there was just no time for that. <laughs> you know? so that's kind of how it started. Yeah, I've been Justin, you got a big smile on you. Oh, I mean, I'm just loving the story. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, for me, obviously, like the 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 meeting of my root teacher, you know, obviously happened during Bodhgaya, uh, during that first trip. And then I came to study with Boker and Pajay afterwards and spent a lot of time in Bodhgaya with him. He passed away. And then this other teacher I had in Sikkim passed away. And, and these three deaths, um, <laughs> they put me through the ringer. Um, but it also really made death a big part of practice. And I think this was the thing, like, um, for a number of years, I was going back and forth between here and India. And there was always a part of me that felt like it stayed in the airport in Delhi. And then I would be here and be half half of me. Um and a decent half of me, but I really liked the half of me that was, <laughs> was in Delhi waiting for me. Um, and when I learned about chaplaincy, this seemed like a way of kind of, you know, having a little bit of, of better integration of um, Dharma experience and, um, and you know, basically right livelihood, right? Like how, how to actually be able to affect this. Because at that time, I only kind of really understood the Dharma bomb thing, right? Like all the, all these people that stay in the Burmese Bihar were 
many of whom I was friends with who had been doing this since the late sixties, early seventies. There was part of me that had assumed actually much like Christiana before the Buddhist studies program, I was like, Oh, Robert Thurman like did this thing. Maybe that's the, the model. And then, you know, getting to India and then seeing how this is a living tradition that's organic and, you know, funky at times made me appreciate that a little bit. And and I kind of came from that kind of household with artistic parents and all this. Um, and probably didn't understand myself in thinking about, about you know, becoming an academic. Um, and it was really all the death that, that, you know, really made me excited about chaplaincy and then, um, and then really grateful as maybe odd as it sounds of being with my teachers or near my teachers when they died um, as a way of, of finding like a spiritual home in being with others, you know, going through this process. Mm. So, so it, it definitely planted an, a lot of seeds that, that kind of move towards um, chaplaincy, broadly speaking, hospice cha- chaplaincy more specifically. But then even in, even, even with corrections, um, just being in intense locations, you know, there's something I, I enjoy, I guess, ultimately about <laughs> being uncomfortable. Um, and so all of, all of the kind of, you know, more unusual experiences, or maybe even you could say unsafe experiences that that happened, you know, in in various trips in India, um, prepped me for some of the the various kinds of unsafe, mm-hmm. difficult experiences. Um, you know, I had on Rikers Island and you know, the cities, uh, the borough jails. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, it's just one of these things. It's like a chapter in a book that you can't. The book would be nothing without this chapter, and. Um, yeah, invariably led me to meet both of you, too. And, you know, Christiana, Christiana and I, you know, worked pretty closely together um, with the way, you know, that um, we intersect. Um, that wouldn't have probably happened, you know, if it wasn't for uh, the Buddhist Studies program. Mm. I had another, just a little flashback to Bodh Gaya, because this, I think um, some years after Antioch program, I was in Bodh Gaya again, and I was with um, Zigar Kongtor Rinpoche, who's also somebody who I've studied a lot with. And he, you know, I didn't have a, a personal, like a, any kind of close relationship with him. I never really talked. I, I studied a lot with him, but I never had a lot of conversations with him. And he called me over one time and he said, oh, can you translate? He, he knew I spoke French and he said, can you translate this? He, there was a French woman that wanted to speak with him. And I said, okay. And so she was, you know, telling some story about she's staying in India for a really long time and whatever she needed some advice. And, and he said to me, you know, tell her she's like a bardo being. She's like, you know, all basically. And he was saying all you people who are kind of in India, hanging on you're like you're like bardo beings you know you can't go home because you don't fit into your culture but you can't really stay here either <laughs> forever and you're kind of like stuck in this bardo yeah. realm and it was that was one of those teachings that I felt like I, I think she spoke English as women so I don't think he really needed me <laughs> to translate that conversation but it was definitely one of those moments where I felt like that's a good teaching you know and uh that also helped me to start to really consider like, you know, what do you actually want to do with your life? <laughs> and how, Do you want to be a bardo being for the rest of this life and just kind of wandering and searching and hoping and, you know, do something with your life. Yeah. This is, this is the phase in the, in the story where, you know, each of us find our own ways of integrating it. I think this is, it's important. I mean, it, you know, it's a same, it's a common origin, but we all went in different directions with it. And, and not maybe at the time it feels uncoordinated or unconscious, but now probably looking back, it makes perfect sense. I mean, Christiana, you're talking about like, I don't really want to be a scholar. And maybe you did wander a little bit, but then you find Nita and then look, I mean, I find it so impressive, the body of work that you do, the commitment that you've done to 
profound and direct huge institutions that make not only preserve a tradition but actually have the healing aspect like actually have a tangible net result benefit to so many people and i don't know that inside of you there was all these skills and maybe it'd take us a, a trickster archetype like dr nita to give you a breadcrumb trail to follow until you you actualize yourself and like you know like i can i can make a contribution this is like did either of you ever feel like becoming a monastic was an option when you were in india and then suddenly like it dawns on you in the transition back to back home to the united states like but that's never going to happen for me i mean or maybe maybe for you justin maybe maybe you got closer but i certainly yeah. i certainly, certainly had that thought for a second and only a second I got like a couple hours away from a haircutting ceremony in Sikkim and um I was do I was doing some retreat with um this teacher who um was actually probably my link to Dr. Nita. It was this he had this dark retreat text he gave me that I later, years later, brought to Dr. Nita because I was curious about it. But um this teacher putting room Pajay was like I asked, oh, you know, will you, you, you know, give me vows? And he's like, oh, yeah, 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 okay. He's like, I don't have a scissor, though. So <laughs> I was like, okay, like, you know, <laughs> take the three-hour journey to Gangtok to go buy, like, you know, a $1 pair of scissors <laughs> and did that. And then I was like, oh, my root teacher's there. Let me go. Let me go tell her about the good, the good news, you know. So I told her, and she was like, that's the stupidest thing you could, <laughs> you could possibly do. And I was like, wait, what? Like, you know, why? And she was like, you're, you're, you're going to be miserable when you go back. You know, she's like, whenever you're like back, back, it's going to be a disaster. Um, and she's probably right, you know. Mm -hmm. But the the one thing I learned from, from her was how thick-headed I could be and uncreative, right, about really listening to who, I am, and I, I kind of see this also in Dr. Nita too, this kind of, um, he seems to be a very, very adept read at people. And I think this is, you know, this is what teachers ought to be really good at is to show people, reflect back who they, who they are, who we are, right? Especially when we can't even imagine, you know, either who we are or it's easier to say, I want to be like this person or that person. Right. No. yeah that mirroring is so key right we're we're, we're young impressionable minds <laughs> yeah. so confused in so many ways yeah. yeah um i definitely thought about <laughs> ordaining it different various times in my life and then ultimately i realized i just wanted to be divor divorced <laughs> not not you know it's not, the same, not exactly the same thing so <laughs> i opted for a divorce <laughs> and, and after that i never had that thought again <laughs> i came back and i found joe luizzo who was a psychiatrist at columbia in new york city and and then through joe his teacher bob thurman i spent a lot of time with both of them maybe 20 years between the two of them and, and and sort of volunteering and teaching at Tibet House. And I, I think for me, the there was really not an option to be a monk. Like I wanted to live in the world and I didn't have a template or a model for how that was going to be possible. And I think Joe was my template. He was somebody who was Columbia trained. He was a physician. He had studied and become a Buddhist scholar under Bob Thurman. There was a lineage there. But he was living in the world. He was teaching visualization at Columbia University to cancer patients when I first met him. And, and again, I mean, talking about Shivananda and your beautiful nun, Justin, and I guess Nita too, his sort of open-heartedness. I mean, I remember meeting Joe for the first time and saying, I'd love to, you know, I, I remember actually sitting down with him after sending my resume and his first question for me was, what can I do for you? And I just, I just, I wanted to be immersed in what he was doing. I, he had a beautiful pecha over his knee and he, and he was teaching directly from some sort of sadhana 
in the hospital. And I thought, oh my God, how can you do that? Mm-hmm. And it felt like, um, I mean, I had already been exposed to John Kabat-Zinn, but it felt like John Kabat-Zinn 3.0 because it was Vajrayana. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly comes full circle. I think all of us mentioned this, like it, the seeds are there, but it's not till much later. I mean, I didn't really connect with the Vajrayana until that moment. And this is already after pursuing Godwin and going to Sri Lanka and do, doing basically the mindful path. And then suddenly I'm with Joe and then Joe says, why don't you go down, go downtown and meet my teacher, Bob Thurman. <laughs> and, you know, that was it. It's like, once I met Bob, I was like a, a lion unleashed. I mean, a giant, but it was really with Joe where this, dual path of like, okay, I'm going to take Dharma and I'm going to stitch it together with a professional life of being a therapist. And I had so much doubts about that path. I I resonate very much with Christiana. I didn't want to be, I didn't see myself getting a PhD, but he kept nudging and nudging and nudging and nudging. Just if I took the whole path with a wide angle lens, I would have said no, but he kept massaging and massaging and got me across the line. And I guess for me, it was the the nexus point was how are we going to deal with trauma? And these two traditions have different lenses, and they they're very complementary. In some places, there there's complexity, but I think that was the central driving thrust that got me to Budgaya, What I was really looking for, what my soul needed, what I what I was so impacted with these great teachers who could cut right through and touch the tenderness of the heart and then when it came time to this chapter that we're all in right now in the story it's like so now what are you going to do like how are you going to make a life in the world not we've all decided we're not going to renounce the world we're going to try to thatch something together and this is where each of the personal mind stream comes in it's like what what's unique about Justin and what's unique about Christiana that what's unique about me and anyone listening. It's like when you're on that store and you meet, you have had the impact that you've had the catalyst or the, the initiation. And then your teacher says, well, what, what are you going to do to bring it forward or bring it into the world? How are you, what's going to be your expression? How are you going to sing this song? It's, it's an old song, but how you sing it, that's what that's your choice and that's a that was a long period of my life i mean this chapter that this this is a 20 some two some 22 23 year chapter and it brings us up to very close to the contemporary time uh, but that that it was never straightforward and it, it required a lot of um experimentation because it's so fresh right i mean the things that we're doing in some ways, haven't ever been done. I mean, Rikers Island, first chaplain to bring Buddhist studies into into that network and uh, developing a global uh, platform for Tibetan medicine. I mean, these are innovations. Um, you know, it's so interesting. It's just look, you know, looking at the two of you and thinking about, you know, some of your teachers and some of my teachers. And I see as we've gotten into this world of Zoom, I start to see all these connections of people from the past who are resurfacing, and then people who are asking advice from each other from very different traditions. And there are these common threads. And I feel, I, I don't know, I feel like there's all these kind of characters in in the big picture and and people are starting to kind of come together and and work together in different ways so it's not so much an individual path it's it's really yeah it's really something beautiful i've encountered a lot of both of your teachers and and um you know to see people asking each other questions you know dr nita asking questions to western psychiatrists you know i think five years ago he might not have had those questions you know just by as we kind of 
encounter different situations and different types of dramas and different type of cultures and, and trying to really see, okay, how are the chaplains working? How are the psychiatrists working? How are the Tibetan doctors working? How are the Western doctors working? How are the lamas working? And, and, and how everybody's kind of piecing this together. It's something kind of really unique that's happening right now, I think. That is really um, a wonderful point, Christiana. It kind of feels like those other transitional moments in the history of transmission of Dharma from one location to another, where it's not just pechas, it's not just texts, right? It's it's everything, like arts, you know, in this particular case, because it's contemporary times, you know, medicine, psychology, um, everything, right? And and it does, I, I, I love what you said, because it, it, it does seem like there are so many attuned people waiting to collaborate mm -hmm. and that's really that's really heartening mm -hmm. actually because i can get a little i can get a little pessimistic about oh gosh you know the the you know whether it's the environmental crisis or you know how weird politics gets these days um you know how binary views are it is really heartening to see people across huge distances too coming together in this way, um, you know, kind of sharpening each other, you know, bringing the best of what they have. Yeah, healing and uh, the other, the one that bubbled up, like, I, I mean, I'm, I love this point of the conversation, Christiana, the co-mingling or co-cross or interdisciplinary dialogue that's happening is so rich and fertile. And what one of the things, the conversations I recently had with uh, Ian Baker was the conversation around psychedelics and Tantra, which, you know, maybe a few years ago would just not be possible. And now that's possible uh, for obvious reasons. The psychedelic movement is really exploding. For me personally, I have a lot of caution about it because, well, I mean, just first of all, I have a lot of cultural critique, but I also I've been enough around enough clients who use psychedelics to know that it's not just a panacea. And I think actually Tibetan Buddhism has a lot to say about how to make those substances actually work to your advantage. And you need a lot more time than one, one stop shop in the ass. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, I have a little bit of a different tradition than you, Justin, but I mean, I think we all understand the importance of the preliminaries. And those preliminaries are not a quick fix. They take time. We all understand the importance of having close mentoring dial and, and, and close intimacy with a mentor who knows every part of our mind, including those parts of our mind that we can't see. <laughs> we all know the importance of sharpening our bodhicitta or the aspiration. And, and then the setting and the initiation are just like one iota of it. Then the integration piece takes takes time takes time and often i mean often that time isn't allotted uh, because again one of the things that we've mentioned already in the conversation is how quick everybody wants it to be and then all of a sudden here's this substance that's gaining a huge amount of traction and it fits conveniently into the shadow desire that we have that there'll be a panacea or a quick fix um you know Tibetan medicine, I'm sure, has the, its own um, slow and steady, gradual approach. I'm sure Dark Retreat offers some caveats that make this, you know, offers concern and at the same time understands the long run that it takes to put these things together in our minds, may make them really stick, whatever, whatever we're talking about, whether it be realization or some sort of integration, physical, mental, all of it. I guess if we want to, we can you know, start to wind up the conversation. I'm going to just ask you to bring us through the pandemic now, from the pandemic, let's say, to where we are right now. The pandemic, I mean, feels like a cultural dark night of the soul. And I'm I'm curious if either one of you made a dramatic about face in any way or confronted something, dropped something, had to shed something, uh, changed something significant. Um, has a new chapter already emerged for you? Or are you still cooking towards something new since the pandemic? 
Well, I would say personally, my life completely changed, you know, well, mostly I'll say like professionally, I mean, also personally, but um, so before the pandemic, at Pier, we had created Pureland Farms, very small retreat center in California, um, without so much thinking of the reality that like we have a very international community, not so we don't know anybody in Los Angeles, um, and very low tech. It was a very low tech <laughs> center. I mean, it, <laughs> microphones didn't exist, online streaming never did it, never heard of it, and that was again one of those things where like the very first day, pretty much. I mean, Dr. Nita was, he was one of the, I would say the first ones to be really concerned about the pandemic. He arrived from, um, you know, he was getting news from China. And so he was kind of telling us about it every day before, you know, before it took off in the States. And then um, he was very concerned and he came to California. We had a big Losar party and then, shut down then we went to new york and <laughs> we went to tibet house concert carnegie hall it was kind of like he was everywhere he went was sort of the last event before <laughs> before it closed and and then you know he went back to italy and very straight away sort of just turned on facebook live and just started teaching because that's what he does you know <laughs> he teaches if there's if he can't teach in person he'll, so but he didn't have a platform so he was just talking on facebook live and then he asked me you know can you i want to teach a tibetan medicine class and no he said can you teach an online nungdro it would be good for people right now and mm -hmm. it's seven days so i you know i bought a microphone and tried to figure it out and we did seven days of nungdro and you know my feeling at that time was by the time the seven days are over, life is going <laughs> to, <we're gonna, laughs> life is going to go back to normal. And then, you know, seven life was not back to normal. And he said, now I want to teach a Tibetan medicine class. I said, okay, you know, for how long a weekend? And he said, um, no, for, you know, a hundred hours and okay, but we don't have a platform. So, well, let's build a platform. And then he said, I want to teach, I want to give all the you talk instructions and, um, so for pretty much for a hundred days, our institution was online like every single day of the week for three or four hours a day. <clears throat> and we had this medicine program where a lot of people decided they wanted to take this course. I think not necessarily because they wanted to study Tibetan medicine, but more, you know, because they were at home and <laughs> they they wanted to do something and stay connected with Sangha. And so we ended up having, you know, really like lots of people. And and then this Utok's heart teachings course we did, I think there were about 800 people online every day and the Tibetan medicine class, a couple hundred people. And then the Tibetan medicine class came to an end and people said, well, what's next? So so we really had to piece together a curriculum, which, which we didn't have because in the old days, the idea was that maybe once a year or twice a year, Dr. Nita would go visit different centers in the world and he would teach for a few days and then they'd have to you know, wait quite a while before the next module. So it was it was actually quite challenging to really work through a long term training or, or curriculum in Tibetan medicine. So suddenly this kind of opened the door up for us. So so we developed a four year program out of it. So we have a four year practitioner program. Then we developed a two year you know mental health program. We have Lama Justin's teaching one year. You know, so suddenly there was this opportunity to have. Um, you know, not only Dr. Nita, but also other teachers that are in Nepal and India and students that are everywhere in the world, probably most of whom will never get on an airplane and come to California. You know, we have students in Mongolia and Buryatia and like, you know, really everywhere. And that just kind of really blew my mind. <laughs> you know, it was, it just completely changed the way, you know, we do things. So, and now I think we're at the phase where it's like, okay, Let's also get back connect, together you know, in, in get, our bodies. <laughs> yeah. So now we're we're kind of finding that balance. But it was it was a really interesting moment. And I think, you know, what I've heard from some of the students that were online was that, you know, those program, those first programs and those first hundred days of the pandemic, like really, you know, really saved them, really made them feel like they were part of a community, that they were connected with people that they had purpose to that time and it, you know it was really transformative for for a lot of people so I felt really um 
you know, I'd say that's one moment where actually I say that I felt proud to be able to <laughs> be behind that and to, and to start that. And then, you know, and now there's all the, of course, the challenges of technology and everything that brought <laughs> with it was this whole other level of, you know, complication and that, that we have to, you know, live with, but it was really something incredible and, and beautiful. And just to really, that made me think of Vajrayana, you know, the interdependence and the, and the capacity for people to just really connect across time and space. It was something really cool. So. Yeah, I think, you know, during the, well, first off, I will say I definitely benefited from the hundred days of you took during um, the, uh, the pandemic. I think that that was absolutely incredible to watch. Um, um, stunning. And I had been one of those people who was trying to piece together, you know, Dr. Nuda traveling around is always oh, teaching Tumo here or this, you know, and I was like, this is never going to work. <laughs> or we'll be able to receive, you know, these things in such a wonderfully organized way. And it, and it happened. Um, um, so I was in you know, again, I got on one of the last flights from Delhi to JFK um, before COVID, um, you know, officially, quote, hit New York City. And the day before I arrived, the first um, employee of New York City died of COVID. And that was a, a, an investigator who worked for corrections. And what I didn't know then was... Um, just how much life would change um, on my end of things, because I was um, not only the head chaplain for New York City Department of Correction, but also the executive director for staff wellness and um, kind of the primary first, like emergency first responder for staff deaths. And um, in that early phase, um, April 2020, um, we had... Uh, it's an alarming number of staff deaths. Our, our, our death rate shot up 500%. Um, and because I was uh, supervised a unit that did all of the um, emergency response triaging around staff who died and supporting their families, I ended up getting COVID uh, pretty early on in that phase. Um, and then was asked... Uh, through our chief of staff by city hall as to whether or not I, I would want to bless the bodies of um new yorkers who ended up on hard island during that time so being buried in, in the potter's field and it was a kind of an amazing time because um you know in in short order i can't remember the number of months but i, I, I the way i remember it is within the first four months of the pandemic or or maybe even less 25,000 people in New York City died. Mm. And a lot of them ended up being temporarily buried on Hart Island because a lot of people didn't have family because of the lockdown who could claim their bodies. Um, so not only was I responding to the situation in New York City jails and also in the community for the, in making home visits um, for correction officers who died, then going to Hart Island um, and there was this one day, uh, one early morning, uh, it was like five in the morning, I was on the ferry, uh, on the on the dock, waiting for the ferry to Hart Island. And I remembered a conversation I had with Dr. Nita about dark retreat. So I was like, you know, oh, well, he's in Italy. And, you know, so it's, it's a good time to message him. So I, I messaged him um, uh, because we had connected a couple of years prior about dark retreat. And he was like, oh, yeah, you know, we just translated the text you know, on this. Um, I could give you instruction on it next week if you want. And I was like, oh, you know, so we connected via Zoom, you know, on Heart Island, which also makes it very sacred to me. Um, and gave instruction on this and then uh, talked with me about how to prepare. And um I waited until it wasn't until 2021 that I I did uh first a preparatory dark retreat and then and then a 40 full 49 day dark retreat and during that time I heard a voice 
that told me or asked me or something, um, you know, you're always like shoulder or neck deep with others in their pain and suffering. Um, is that going to change? Is it, is that going to transform their minds? And I recognized in that moment, and maybe it probably had something to do with just the intensity of all of the death that I'd seen um, during the pandemic. Um, but I realized I, I had to change what I was doing. Um, and so I um, left that retreat and, you know, came home and told my wife, <laughs> I need to quit my job. Uh, and it took about six months to kind of line everything up um, to be able to do that. Um, just so I could be, you know, a full-time Dharma teacher and, uh, and focus on, on, on dark retreat, uh, with Dr. Nita. Um, and it totally, you know, it, 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 it made perfect sense. And it was a similar kind of thing when I was, when I had come out of retreat, Dr. Nita also was in retreat. So we had to wait for our schedules to align and we did, and we met by, by Zoom and, he kind of examined um, my experiences and then he was like, so did you like it? And I was like, oh, I loved it. I was like, you know, in fact, I really wasn't expecting saying this, but this is really the practice for me. And he's like, good, start a retreat center. <laughs> for it. So much like Christiana, right? Like the, uh, and it's, this has been, you know, this is a, it's a long-term project, uh, but one that is very meaningful and um, gives a different sense of purpose uh, than I've been used to. Um, but I can't, I can't separate like the, um, I, I think it's all told now, like, you know, I've blessed over 4,000 bodies, you know, from, from Heart Island and uh, just been in all these really intense situations, which, Ultimately, I'm very grateful for because that's kind of like the the energy needed to cause the shift to the new thing. Um, and so everything has changed, you know, for, for me, um, you know, uh, since the pandemic um, in, in a really, in a way, that, again, much like all the other changes in my life, much more rich and much more authentic than I probably could have imagined otherwise um yeah, just just incredible and then and then of course this led you know i met christiana in 2016 uh coming out to portland um and this is the the other beautiful thing about this is like you know it's just like bringing you know friends together right and and dharma family together um uh that i'm i'm really grateful for um and you handed me that text Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Because I just, yeah. So there was this, uh, this uh, elderly Rinpoche um, in Sikkim who I happened to meet. Actually, I met him on the doorstep of Ani, Z Ani Zangmo's place when I returned back to her, uh, uh, her after college. Um, she was quite ill at that time, and Padang Rinpoche was there to um, do prayers and. Um, you know, basically serve her, you know, take care of her. Uh, we arrived at exactly the same time at the, on the doorstep at the same time. And um, a couple years later, he gave me this, you know, text full of visions that come up in dark retreat and um, said he would teach it to me. And, uh, but that, that opportunity never happened because I, I became a father relatively young and that, reduce the amount of time I could the, the length of my stays in in Asia um and and then I showed it to Dr. Nita and you know he was like where did you get this you know and I told him about Padang Rinpoche and he's like well who you know who was his teacher and it was Shukseb who was one of the teachers of Dr. Nita's Ani teacher Ani Ani uh, Geltsen and he was like, oh, you know, it's like we're related in this way. And and so there's a lot of like beautiful kind of, A, Dr. Nita reminds me a lot of Anizamo, just in, in terms of the spontaneity and, you know, relative irreverence that, that he, you know, they both um, demonstrate. But then B, the fact that he, you know, one of his heart teachers was 
a woman was also really important to me. Uh, and I remember actually in the Hundred Days of Yutok, he was talking about all of the flack he would take in uh, in Lhasa, uh, you know, when he was at the at the Men Sikang, you know, in his free time going to study with this Ani, and everyone was like, oh, why are you studying with an Ani? You know, this is, he could be studying with a Kempo or a monk or, you know, a Rupache or something. And he was like, at the end of my memory, it was, he was like, oh, these people don't know. <laughs> And this is exactly how I felt about, you know, Ani Zangmo. So, um, yeah, it's amazing, right? Like, you know, Miles, like you you mentioned COVID as, as kind of one of these epoch shifting events. And I actually haven't spent a lot of time necessarily thinking about it that way. So it's been really refreshing to think of it. And then, and then the really beautiful thing, too, is just the way how in the midst of a global tragedy there's beauty that can can come you know internally externally you know relationally it's you know so so extraordinary yeah i just i see again to maybe close out you know siana's in italy and it's getting late for her and i've really loved this conversation and maybe one day just in some yurt and pure land farms we can continue the conversation over a cup of something but yeah I, there is a movement forward there's a stepping up and stepping out of some old way of doing things that i think is you know in common in the storyline when we started way back in but gaia we had our initiation and a lot of seeds were planted then there was a 20 year period of career making and maybe fulfilling the wishes of of whatever masters we were with and then there's you know another chapter and i think covid is a for me will be a definite line in the sand i mean it'll definitely demarcating event for me i i i spent 20 plus years with joe and bob and then i decided to go out on my own and i just thatched together the inkling of an online platform and i was going to teach two years of Lamrim. And then I started having uh, a vision in Greece, actually, of the need to bring in mythology and some other disciplines into the curriculum. So I wasn't just doing standard Lamrim fare, neuroscience and trauma and mythology and astrology. Some of these core disciplines that I had exposure to a long time ago, but they were just dormant. And right before the pandemic hit, there were a couple of events like psychic events that I had. I'm writing about them right now in my new book. But in, 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 in essence, I had the same experience that Christiana described, which is the platform was ready. The pandemic hit and it was like a lifeboat in the cloud. I mean, we all just piled in and closed the doors and spent two years together, like doing some of the most earnest study that you, I mean, it was like instantly, just instantly, like people needed something to do. People needed to be, get, need, needed to something to focus on. Uh, Geshe Tenzin Zopa, my teacher, we pulled him in every once in a while. And then we just, we just went for it. And it was so necessary and so rich and we went so deep. I mean, it really, it's an underestimation what can happen in the midst of crisis. Like I don't look at it back or back. I look back and I say that we could have had it no other way. Like the, that movement into one's own process at that time, just it, it was so rich. And, you know, so, I mean, we didn't have 800 people worldwide like you guys did. I mean, that's incredible, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, what matters is that people people found a mandala, and and the teachings, the old the old teachings. You know, we started with that quote of going back. There's the lamrim, and then suddenly we're also talking about trauma and how to keep your mental health about you when people are dying, as Justin's describing a an un, unimaginable situation in which to find yourself on the front line 
as a chaplain in a novel coronavirus event with as many people dying around you as possible, and suddenly the churnal ground that your Ani introduced you to 25 years or 30 years earlier comes full circle. And boom, there it is. And honestly, you're too humble, uh, Christiana, but the same thing happened to you. It's like these an opportunity presented itself for you to make a mandala that actually saved lives spiritually, you know, and yeah, so it was really, really rich. And then, I mean, for me, I, I'll always look back on those two years as like a really very profound time. And then I also felt really burned out by it because I was working alone. And this is one of the things that I hear you echoing, like about the archetype of collaboration, like I was very much soloed and siloed. Like I was holding in the way that Justin describes a lot of anxieties for people and a lot of felt a lot of duty and responsibility. And that's a lot of psychic energy. So by the time we came out of it, like I, I couldn't hold it anymore. Like I, I burnout is just too kind of word. <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, and so you know, recently I just decided to close the school that I, we, you know, it was like it served its purpose. That that image of the Buddha talking about a raft that meets to the other side, it, it really did. It just, the Contemplative Studies per, uh, program served its purpose. And then uh, I looked at my wife and I said, I want to move to Bali, bring the kids and start a new life. Like, and uh, yeah, so I've been on Bali for a year now, like being very quiet. I don't, do a lot of teachings right now. I've been writing the book and things are, maybe it's like a, a, a an extended dark retreat without, uh, without it being so dark. Did you describe it, Justin, that there was a, a yellow retreat? There is a yellow retreat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right now I've been doing a lot of water purifications with the tantric, the tantric Hindus, uh, the, uh, the shaman is the shamans of and the wisdom keepers of Bali have a beautiful water purification practice. And so I've been kind of keeping my head down and going through this extended period of dissolution and sort of wrestling with what's underneath it, which I can imagine I have 40 days and 40 nights in a dark retreat. It's not all that glamorous sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, if we're really honest, like, that's what we sign up for. That's what rebirth means. And that's what the archetype of the pandemic is on a social global level. There is dissolution, sometimes chaos, so plenty of uncertainty and unknown variables to go around, a lot of fear. I almost describe it or imagine it as, an, a, a, is it an alembic in, in alchemy where you know the fire underneath it creates a schism and all the impurities float to the top like in our culture the deep-seated history of racism is now revealed or the pedophilia trafficking or whatever it might be it's like on a cultural level the you know the institutions that have governed our our countries and our cultures for so long the corrosive underbelly is being revealed and they're starting to break down and that's just the equivalent of what happens in one's own psyche too. If you really commit to some of these intensive practices, that there's something that normally holds you together that then comes undone and there's a con a, some sort of confrontation, but then there is also some light that comes through. And I think that's, I think that's the archetype that we're living in. And I don't think it's going to be instant. I don't think the pandemic ends and everything gets rebuilt just like I don't think you do one of these retreats and every, or you go for a year on Bali and you're somehow put back together anew. I think we're kind of just now wading through it all and trying to find a, an integration. And so I really like what you're saying about collaboration, the spirit of collaboration of come, people coming together, not not the least of which Dharma networks with and also interdisciplinary dialogues to help us sense make and navigate the new terrain that we're now in. Because I don't believe there is a kind of going back. I think there is just going forward and hopefully it's going to be something better and have a lot of patience with it, infuse it with a lot of integrity. 
So maybe I'll conclude here with just offering you a little bit of time to have any concluding thoughts on the matter and maybe an aspiration. You know, it's one of the reasons I was curious to meet you, Miles, was because I, I also I spent quite a long time in Bali. I feel very kind of heart connection with that place. And I see your pictures in Greece, so I feel somehow, you know, the energy of those lands. But um, yeah, it's, I, I really feel at this particular moment, I actually feel a lot of uncertainty about you know, the future and, and I would like to, yeah, really make an aspiration that to, you know, for Dharma to really be genuinely take root in the heart, because I think that's really kind of the only path. And I can see how, how it's easy to get also, you know, when, when you're engaged in a lot of activity and a lot of, you know, especially beneficial activity, like we all are that then also sometimes, to get lost in the activity and to maybe lose that internal connection. So that's, I just kind of voicing this out loud also for myself, a personal aspiration to really stay on the path because, you know, at this point, I, I don't, I feel a lot of actually uncertainty about, about where the world is going and the future, <laughs> the future. And um, it's not like a, not so much a fear, but really, it's it's really one of those moments where I feel like I, I really don't know, <laughs> you know, what what the future's going to bring. And I also don't know that all the doing, doing, doing is always the answer, you know, so I, I, I respect your your choice to, you know, to take that time and to, I also feel it's important to, that we all kind of simplify our lives to some extent and while still you know staying engaged and and connected so that's a it's a kind of a moment for me where I feel like trying to working out that balance a little bit to you know fulfill the life mission but also to not to make sure not to really lose the the core in in the process and just kind of see what see what unfolds I don't know I don't know what's coming really yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know what's coming as well. Um and I, I kind of share Christiana the the a similar kind of feeling about um maybe it's not gonna not that it's gonna be bad necessarily, but maybe it's not gonna be so good either. Um <laughs> and what what this kind of draws home for me is like, you know, maybe this idea whether we use you know kind of like the age of aquarius or you know whatever the, the metaphor is going to be um what seems to be really important are communities of the development and touching into deep wisdom in simple ways so whether it's so rigpa you took or miles the work you're doing you know distilling everything both in Bali, um, you know, with the shamanic tradition that's there and with, um, you know, with the Buddhist tradition or, you know, myself with the dark retreat and you took and, and other things is, I, I tend to feel like um, we are all here as part of a larger collaborative reason to keep things going and to to provide um, respite and healing and focus and dharma in these times where maybe some of the systems are going to fall away, right? And what's more, like where each individual person becomes the retreat place or the the sacred ground. Um, and um you know where 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 this is more i don't know i tend to think a little bit that some of these systems are going to fall away before the next thing happens and uh and that ultimately that's a good thing but it's chaotic and it really requires in order for people to stay rooted um it requires work that i i think that maybe on a cultural level we've 
fallen a little out of relationship to. Um, I think, you know, like both of you and, and I can, I can think of other people that are this kind of burgeoning community of, of people that are supporting one another and innovating and collaborating. Um, there's a lot of really fascinating new manifestations of Dharma that will happen. Um, You know, and just given the truth of impermanence and <laughs> the way the cult, the the climate change <laughs> crisis is going, for me at least, the writing on the is on the wall that you know there really isn't a lot of time, you know, that we have, um, and so the time that we have, may we show up well for one another uh, towards, and may we make use of practice, and may it be deep, and may it be. Um, May all of the kind of jadedness and all of these things be polished away, you know, by by um, by an enthusiasm and a, and a passion. Um, you know, I think we're made for these times ultimately, um, and you know, need to rely on one another in these times too. Beautifully put. I think that's a great way to come together. And thank you so much to both of you, not only, you know, for sharing so much time today, but all of the very rich travels and journeys that you've been on, all of that you've connected, all of that you've lost, and all of that has been parlayed to what you offer. And so it's it's a real pleasure for me to connect with both of you and to to sort of seal our connection so wherever we may you know see each other next that there's a, a springboard for something down the road i don't think any of this is you know random i think it's taken this long and <laughs> now there's something <laughs> something in the work another seed llama maybe you can spring sprinkle some rice over us or something <laughs> Uh, just let me move the big vajra around <laughs> there, there you go a ritual seal and for every anybody that's uh listening you know i'm sure if you made it through you can resonate with your own journey uh through whatever avenues periods of where things are absolutely clear things times where things are not clear at all things where think times where things are dissolving i think one thing is clear there's always the the, the through line you know, Dharma is always a through line, and so I'm, 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 I just want to conclude with that beautiful thing that Godwin said to Christiana, which was, just come, you know, just come. Uh, there was a lot of very deep wisdom and simplicity there. Also, just come. Until next time, what a wonderful, wonderful moment in time to share with you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Wisdom Keeper podcast. If you've enjoyed this presentation of sacred knowledge, kindly like, subscribe, review, and share our podcast and video series on YouTube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.